I would be an old Bailey barrister, but I would rather you embraced me, dear mentor. And am I blessed to have the both of you to serve me? You are instructed. This goes very well. Who is this? William Garry. Court shall rise. Two hangings before lunch. Recommend the broth. And I recommend you read your brief again. Guilty. No! No! I will pay for Mr. Garrett. This young woman may be executed in consequence of your evidence. Will you not dare to venture to recall? My husband would consider my participation in this an infidelity. Not guilty. <laughs> Prosecutor is a gentleman. I've read the brief. Of Cavendish Square. Julius Champion Crest. Pronounced Creighton. What I mean to say is be careful. You are not invulnerable, William. And how will I defend William Hayward? Indeed. Now, William. He shall not speak on his own behalf, and I shall not call witnesses. He shall be innocent until proven otherwise. Mr. Creighton shall have to prove guilt, and with my assistance, he shall not. was indicted for stealing on the 21st of August last one pair of plated chariot harness, value 10 shillings, the property of William Champion Craigney Esquire. How do you plead? Not guilty, sir. Call William Craigney. Hayward was my coachman a very few months. He quitted it the 12th of August. I paid him his wages and went to the country. After I had been in Berkshire three or four weeks, I wrote to town for the old harness, and it did not come. Why write for the old harness, Mr. Crabbe? I required it. I see. And you have two coaches? I have one. Ah, well. I am indeed sorry for that. <laughs> Mr. Garrow. So, but one coach, and you required, all of a sudden, two harnesses. Am I at fault for requiring my property? Was the old harness laid by as unserviceable? I knew it was useful, but might want repair. Then, if not unserviceable, unusable, but still you wrote for it. I am not at fault for that. Did it have a sentimental attachment? It pained you to be separate from it. Was that your only fault, that you loved it too well? My lord, you will not mock me, sir. Mr. Garrow, address yourself the evidence and how to disprove it. When this coachman was engaged, did you make a bargain with him? I did, of course. Good. And I will trouble you to state it. I believe at first he asked for 26 guineas. I do not recollect. This will be very important. I'm afraid I must trouble you to tax your recollection. I believe in the end the standing wages agreed for it to be 22 guineas together with other articles. Yes? Yes, yes. Now we do make progress. I cannot say. Do you recollect whether he was to have the old wheels and the old harnesses to make up the sum? I never allowed old wheels and old harnesses to any coachman. Well, then explain to me what those articles were that were to make up the 22 guineas to be 26 guineas. I believe... 
I believe uh, I paid him 25 guinea. I do not have such a minute recollection. A few moments ago, you recollected it perfectly. Now you will guess away a man's liberty. 25 guineas. I understood you. The agreement was 22 guineas a year wages. But what other agreements did you make besides? Uh, I believe there were boots and britches and a uh, number of... Uh, a number of etc. that the coachmen generally have. Etc. Etc. <laughs> An old harness in want of repair. Under the pretense of my giving it to him, he took the plated harness out of my stable. Upon this man being discharged, did he, by your desire, deliver you an inventory of the things in the stable? He did. Good. Do you have the inventory here? <laughs> of course I have not. Ah. What if I was to tell you the old harness is not listed in it? Impossible. And if I have here the inventory that proves it? My lord, this is improper. Mr. Garrow, are you attempting to introduce new evidence? My lord, I'm merely introducing the face of Mr. Crapney to the jury at this moment. <laughs> it was my fervent wish that they marked. <laughs> Mr. Garrow, I will not have such tricks in my court. My Lord, I apologise for the creation of such a misleading impression. But I cannot best Mr. Crapney, who stands before me in the way of that vice. Mr. Crapney, I believe that at the time you parted, you were in considerable displeasure with this man. I was. And how it shows still. How it shows. No more questions, my lord. Who will you call now, Mr. Sylvester? The shaking servant still in the gentleman's employment? <laughs> I call Benjamin Weaver, servant to Mr. Crepney. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Mr. Sutas? You're welcome. You attract some attention, Mr. Garrow. You will introduce yourself, sir? Thomas Rawlings, from the London Gazette. You see, he came for a murder, but all he has today is a diary item that a defence counsel was witty. Come. Witty, fierce and merciless. You think so? I think the coffee house a better engagement than this. Mr. Garrow, do you seek to change the nature of the trial? Are the lawyers and not the judges to turn events now? The defence of the individual against against the power of the state, the rights of defendants, against the rights of those who seek to prosecute them. Oh, come away. You are not a pamphlet. But he solicits my views. Let your vanity be in the interests of your clients, not in the interests of yourself. You are envious. You are careless. Are the judges to read in the London newspapers that you intend to take control of their courtrooms? That can happen case by case. It does not require you to become famous. Mr. Sylvester, what do you think of Mr. Garrow speaking? I think it is like a racehorse. It runs fast because it carries a feather. And you are even lighter because you carry no convictions at all. Mr. Garrow, can you expand more on the defence of the individual against the power of the state? attack unsuspecting women with such a weapon is a crime rendered still more atrocious by the savage delight he enjoys in the terror, pain and distress of the lovely victim. Elegant and attractive women almost without exception. Gentlemen, I will open a subscription to raise a reward of one hundred pounds. Fifty! Fifty pounds! For the arrest of such a vile person. And a further fifty upon conviction. 
So, so uh, a journalist from my own newspaper. I cannot think I pay him well enough to subscribe to this reward. <laughs> <laughs> sir, I wondered... I wondered, is there not the danger that... Danger, that, sir? That... that this may lead to the apprehension of innocent men. Innocent men may be inconvenienced. Innocent women will be saved. Thank you, sir. Very good, sir. I will quote you directly. And at length. Guinea fee for our defense of Elizabeth Jarvis. You should make payment to Mr. Suthouse. He will then make payment to myself. I see. He did not explain this to you. Yes, I, I do recollect now. It is of no matter. You did not tremble as you made your way here. Why would that be so? The monster, the sanguinary terror. Ladies are now having copper petticoats fitted to protect them. Yes, I thought he did enter my chambers with a very decided gait. The only metal in my petticoats are my stays, Mr. Carrow. And you are not enthralled to this new fever? No, I have not that fever. Yet I have defied my husband. I was not to go out unless in company. Yet here you are and not in danger. I'll go to Milk Street and to Mr. Suithouse to make rightful payment there. Sir, you are not so mistaken about your errand here. Judge Buddha, you can assure me that when this monster is caught, he can be hung. So that you may proudly assure the public. And that would not just be politic, it would be reasonable, would it not? It's a question of finding the right indictment that will see him hang. It's been difficult. But I find we are indebted to the sixth act of George the First. The cutting of cloth? Felony. Introduced in 1721 to address the issue of English weavers slashing garments made of cloths from India. But what is this to do with a monster? Our monster does not murder. And common assault, even with intent to maim or kill, is a misdemeanor. But this, this cutting of cloth, is a felony, punishable by hanging. If a bad law will become London, we must have it. I hear there are calls for a permanent police patrol in light of the monster. That would be very expensive for the Treasury. The Home Secretary will be most grateful to you. Porter is down there, sir. He came upon me like a madman, and suddenly I found myself brought down into a most indelicate position. On your hands and knees? I had more regard for decorum than my well-being. I'm sorry to have to make you revisit your most foul ordeal, but it's it merely by way of cataloguing the man's crimes and so build up a body of evidence against him. And will news of my welfare appear in your newspapers? With all the other victims of this most aggrieved city, Miss Porter. I see. One further question, if I may. Certainly. The wound. It heals now? Thankfully so. And anatomically, the thigh or higher up? Higher up? 
up, sir. Higher up. You bear it most courageously. you'd not venture out unaccompanied. I had no wish to have Mrs. Browning as my companion. Well, then you wished a monster to keep you company? Then should I stay at home, employed at my needle and thread? Arthur, I'm not strung high as a violin. Screaming at gusts of wind, I've never been. Well, that is why I did engage you at the Old Bailey. I did make you a guest of Judge Buddha to serve both of us. But your welfare to me is not your progress. It's your safety. Maria, this is too much to bear. Oh, to be out in public again. No. What then? That man, that man there. You know him. Yes, I know him. I recognize him. That man is the monster. He is the monster that did attack me. Get me water. Stop. Get it. Get it. Get me water. Stop. <laughs> It is nine o'clock in the morning. Your son was arrested yesterday afternoon. Yes, sir. I am therefore obviously not the first attorney whose assistance you have sought. No, no, sir. This morning, your son is the most unpopular man in London. No other attorney has wished to represent the monster. He is not the monster. He has alibis for each occasion. He is not the monster because he is my son. A mother knows what her son may be capable of. And while Rennick may be many things, sir, he... What kind of things? I did read that 22 women were called to the magistrates in total. Well, half of them claiming Rennick bore a resemblance to their attacker, but not able to swear to it. And the other half unable to do either, sir. So pray, what would that tell you? That you neglect your mathematics, madam. There was one who did swear to it, a Miss Anne Porter. But the numbers are good enough for me. Let us hope it is good enough for counsel. I have heard of a Mr. Garrow. Oh, I am sure of that. Monster at bay. <laughs> God is merciful. Mm. Not to those other poor wretches wrongly accused and brought up before the magistrate. Yeah, they have him now for certain. Rennick Williams, 23, a native of Wales, no doubt, and an artificial flower maker. Hardly an occupation for a monster, but at least he'd be not an Englishman. Will this be an end to your agitation? I agitate for London. Well, the press reports from the Magistrates' Court have thankfully been extensive. And it appears there is only one indictment, which is willfully and maliciously cutting Anne Porter's cloak, gown, stays, petticoat and shift. And injuries to buttocks or thighs? Disregarded. This indictment of cutting clothes is surely not a felony. You should know your law better than I. You plead a case, do not expect more. They wouldn't dare to make the monstrous crimes a mere misdemeanour. In London's current fever, that would cause an outrage. So, in the cutting of clothes, they have found a felony. How so? They've dug up an obscure and very perverse statute from 1721. I cut to the flesh. It's only pillory or prison. But if I merely cut cloth, I will hang. Strange, in fact. But true in law. You will take the brief. Visit him in Newgate. It is worth surely that. In 
London's eye, you are a beast. A creature beyond the pale. Now, what I learned from Mr. Suithouse and what London must also know is that you are... Respectable. A man who makes his way in society happily and modestly. My son was in the theatre. A violinist and teacher of dance also. I myself dance like the movements of heavy cavalry. But it was very difficult to issue the opportunities it gave me. To guide the movements of the limbs of high-born maidens. She has played violin in theatre orchestras. Rennick, you will tell them of your musical gifts. I screeched a living with my bow. Until the orchestra pits of London swooned with the smell of the drink I'd taken. I beg your pardon. What I mean to say is that I possessed a spirit of such effervescent gaiety. The trammels of art were just too much of a confinement. Mother, is that some improvement? Are you the monster? Good. A man as direct as myself. Then you will oblige me with a direct answer. Mr. Garrow, I cannot lie. I am a man who does indeed go after women. I lay siege to them in restaurants, dancing parlours, assembly rooms. And if I am lucky, they will allow me to lay into expenses for them. And if I'm very lucky, they will allow me to lay... Renick, you will stop this now. He has settled in a permanent position now. He's a flower maker. He has put the habits of the past behind him. In defence of me, there is no one more vociferous or loyal. Do you think you can summon up such a feat of conviction, Mr. Garrow? If he is not the monster, he certainly enjoys his monstrosity. But surely you can still plead a case. You can already conjure up with the prosecution, you say. He's a lecherous liberty. So you will not take this case because you think you may lose it? I will it. not take this case because I cannot well defend it. Your rising reputation, no match for the grime attached to his name. Huh. How does a man bound for hell propel you? Justice is not applause. Approval is not the law. I cannot do what is not in my heart to do. You were called to the bar. They did not announce your heart there. Your business done here, gentlemen. It seems the business of one gentleman here is certainly done. I have refused to defend the monster. From conscience? If you would listen to Mr. Suithouse, he would not venture that I am troubled by morals here. Madam. It is not a popular cause. You think me too much impressed with my popularity? It must be a true novelty to you. I find I do like approval. I have no parents alive who might do the approving. I am sorry for that. But you may be sorry if you do not fulfill your duty. But Sarah, win the case, and I will not be thanked for it. Lose it, and I will be remembered as the monster's apologist. If Mr. Williams does not have representation and is hung, that will not be the outcome of the trial, but simply a lynching. Gentlemen. Mr. Sylvester. If I take a fee from the monster, I may never get another. Has Mr. Garrow already refused it? Mm. Finally, he understands how discretion is the better part of valor. Or is it that you will only defend those that will add to the sum of your goodness? There we have it, Garrow. Not the reforming revolutionary, but an insufferable hypocrite. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Angerstein. Afternoon. Forgive me. John Julius Angerstein. I see you take my publication. A man of judgment in all things, I am. We have business, sir. The monster is your client. I would venture there is no respectable attorney in London who would wish to receive a guinea to defend his crimes. Therefore, I am not a respectable attorney, sir. Well, I'm sure that is something I could persuade you to remedy. This comes from what, sir? That you fear I have lost my moral sense, or that representation may mean success? You wish the man success? I wish him the chance to plead his case. And you have counsel engaged in this? Of course. You take my newspaper, Mr. Soutas. Beware. It may take you. Sir, his mother engages me, and I am very fond of his mother. I believe her. I'm sorry that you endure this. I would rather you defend my son than myself, sir. I will happily lose a basket, but I will not so happily lose my son's life. Colleagues at the flower factory. They will attest to your attendance on the day of this attack. There is an hour they will not be able to account for. An hour. It is thirsty work there. I see. In the name of the inn you did frequent. Several. And witnesses there who will attest to your character. Have we dispensed with alibi? Yes, I think we have. My character. To show that what you are accused of is inconsistent with who you are. I'm sure there are some who would say that I am a man, normal in my appetites. Mother, your attendance here is a credit to you, but it's not really necessary. If there are ladies of your acquaintance who will appear in court for you, then you must inform Mr. Garrow. Mother... You must do so! They are prostitutes. They are the ladies of my acquaintance. And less up to judgment on my station or my manners. Very welcoming. I bring these men here to save you, Rennick. Please give them the incentive to do it. And please, son, do not deprive me of the incentive to wish it. Mother, it may be that you should not let me detain you. How can you speak to me so? Half my life you have watched me disappoint you and worn a brave face through it. Perhaps you should not trouble yourself so painfully anymore. But you did not do it! You are not the monster! Alas, I am a very good fit. You have a mother, Mr. Garrow? No. It is my good fortune and her hell. You are not sentenced yet. Then let us go to it. The ladies of your acquaintance, you mentioned that they were less apt to judgment on your station or your manners, less apt than who, Mr. Williams? Than that bitch. 
What person do you refer to? Anne Porter. You knew her already, did you not? Oh, yes. Why would she not let me seduce her? No alibi, character witnesses from a bawdy house, and a motive to harm Ann Porter. Good God, we'll never earn our guineas here. In none of these newspaper accounts does Ann Porter anywhere suggest that Renwick Williams was previously known to her. You look to the newspapers for the preparation of your defence. We have no other intelligence, Mr. Sudhouse. Angus Dean's journals only further the case for the prosecution. You will find nothing to encourage you here. And your hands will be black with newsprint. Good day. And I like Renwick Williams a little more. It's not surprising. How so? He's wayward, outspoken, rude, belligerent, and an enemy unto himself. Do you suggest? The likeness is remarkable. Mr. Angersley. A runner has just informed me the monster has struck again. Another woman attacked and he was called to her assistance. And it appears it was in the very way the monster does go about his work. And did this new victim make complaint? At the magistrate's court. And nowhere else reported? I've enlisted the runner as a source of information for a guinea or two. You will not report this. On the eve of the trial, such a revelation would create unnecessary alarm and divert attention from the crimes of a man already identified. Would you wish Renwick Williams to go free because a woman yesterday made complaint, which we print? But there is the danger that another newspaper may find themselves privy to this information and not feel quite so delicate about it. And there is a danger that you will be in want of employment if you press the matter. The trial of this monster begins tomorrow. And? I thought to accompany you. There will be some uproar there. Do you wish to stop up my ears from the oaths? Stand fast lest the mob invade the bench in their frenzy and overcome me. Judge Buddha will be the man for that. He will throw his arms about you. <laughs> that is a thought not to be born. What would be your purpose? I merely wish to observe the trial that is the talk of London. Such frivolity from one so steeped in higher matters. Together, we could observe, and then we could engage about it. You wish to engage me? It's my only wish. Mr. Garrow. Mr. Williams. You're in want of more information. I merely thought you may wish some company. You did bring some, then. Sir? As you do not appear to be in possession of a small waist or dainty feet yourself. <laughs> I 
Am I to be hung tomorrow? Well, I must be honest with you, the whole of London has its hands on the rope. But if the law does its duty and I'm allowed to do mine, I think we may overcome the prosecution. And then you will save me from damnation. Oh, from death, perhaps, but in life I think you are hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> Your hands are black as a devil. Yes, newsprint. God, who does rampage now through our streets, wielding his terrible weapon? Oh, it's Garrow's infallibility. Let loose upon us all. Rennick Williams was indicted for the key on the 18th of July last month for force and arms at the parish of St. James on the King's Highway, unlawfully, willfully, and feloniously make an assault on Anne Porter. You no longer find favour with the public gallery, Mr. Garrett. Take care. Has humanity taken flight from this damn place? To wit, one silk gown, value 20 shillings, a pair of stays, value 5 shillings. You who slaver like dogs at the sight of a bone. Silk petticoat, value five shillings. Newgate is a haven of civilization in comparison to this dog's kennel. Against the form of the statute and against the king's peace. Mother. I did warn you. It's never a most congenial place. And Rennick too infamous to expect Lord fairness. I must return. From your poster, Mr. Angerstein. The monster is generally described as six feet high, thin made, thin visaged, full eyes, a large nose, and is marked with the smallpox upon his cheekbones. Now look, if you will, at the appearance of Mr. Williams. Five feet six, round-faced, and no sign of smallpox. Men such as these are capable of a fiendish cleverness. What, to gain six inches in height? <laughs> you have invested a great part of your energy and reputation in this case. Well, I thought I was fortunate enough to be able to exert some influence on the outcome. You mean that your efforts would hope to furnish arrest and conviction? I would think it be the hope of anyone in London to see such a conclusion. And is it not the case that what you would settle for as a conclusion was the arrest and conviction of any man who might fit this sorry position? And in Rennick Williams, you think you had found him, and the matter over and done. In all this, I wished merely to save young women from danger. I have here a collection of interviews you conducted with the victims of the monster and were published in your own newspaper. The interviews were conducted under the general title, An Authentic Account... Of, of the barbarities lately practised by the monster. Then you do recognise them as your own? I do. Good. Why did you note the dress and appearance of the victims that you interviewed? I thought a description of each of the fair victims to be interesting. May 12th. The victim is young, below the middle size, with blue eyes that do allure. Pale, soft skin, fine teeth, delicate and pretty. Do you recognise her? Mary Forster. And another, June 6th. Young, about or rather below the middle size, shiny black hair, striking black eyes, full lips, a dainty waist, an agreeable countenance, and again, very, very pretty. It's Rebecca Godfrey. What a noble opportunity it presented to be able to sympathise with those beautiful women, yes? Well, 
To sympathize, certainly, but also to obtain information. And provide a good excuse to visit them repeatedly. You will not imply... Only further to display your sympathy and want of information. It seems, sir, that you wish to save handsome young ladies from danger. If only to put them in the way of another. Yourself. <laughs> no further questions, ma'am. Thank you, sir. For Surgeon Tompkins. The case goes better, madam. Decidedly so. The wound, Surgeon Tompkins. Can you tell me of its appearance? Uh, four or five inches long. Uh, its middle part had penetrated the skin to a depth of an inch or so. A wound, in your view, only rendered by a sharp instrument? Most certainly. And but for the bow of the stays, the wound might have penetrated the abdomen. If not for the bow of the stays, this may have been a murder. And the brave Miss Porter that did suffer such trauma? Is she fortunate still to be living? Oh, yes. Your witness, Mr. Garrett. <laughs> Murder, you say? Intend to kill? Or at least maim. Excellent. No further questions, my lord. No further questions. It seems that Mr. Gallo knows more of his law than we at first supposed. He's called Anne Porter. swear that you shall present the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Miss Porter, you can identify the man who maimed and abused you so cruelly. I can. And if it is not too much to bear, I wonder if you would venture to do so. <laughs> Miss Porter, may I commend you for the grace and valour with which you have appeared here today? I am aware of the great attention which has fallen on me, but I merely wish to do my duty as a prosecutor, sir. Even with the eyes of London upon me. Especially with the eyes of London upon me. No more questions. I was not aware that you had asked any. <laughs> Miss Porter. You will forgive me, Miss Porter, if any of my questions might confuse or dismay you. I can assure you that no man in this court may sympathise more with your sufferings than I. But firstly, I must insist to my lord, the judge, that the veil be removed. For I cannot bear to have the wretch stare upon me or look upon him. My lord, I ask that the veil be removed so the jury may see... How my questions demand a truth that cannot simply come from speech, but from the colours of a female cheek. Miss Porter, you will remove the veil. Can you describe what your assailant was wearing on the day you were attacked? A tight-fit coat. Oh, it's a tight-fit coat today, is it? Can you explain why you told the magistrate that it was a great coat, a surtout? Uh, I was confused. It may it have something to do with the fact that a runner, having searched Mr. William's lodgings, found no great coat, as you had sworn it, but a tight coat, and now conveniently you concur with that. He came upon me suddenly. I was, oh! I was mesmerized by the night before me. Oh, the wretch! 
words did your assailant speak to you on the night you were attacked? Insults. Such as? I cannot bear to recall such obscene and gross... Bear it, madam. I will not... Blast your eyes, you damned bitch! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Mr. Carroll! Beg your pardon, my lord. I'm merely quoting what comes from the magistrate's committal. Blast your eyes, you damned bitch. I would take a particular pleasure in murdering you and drowning you in your own blood. You do recall recalling that. I have tried to put it out of my mind. How would you describe your state of mind in the minutes after your attack? It must have been a most terrifying experience. I was insensible with fear. But not so insensible that you could provide a thorough description of your attacker and identify Mr. Williams here. However agitated I might be, I should have always known him. His features are more impressed on my recollection than that of my most intimate friends. And because you were previously acquainted with him. Not acquainted, but accosted, sir. You will tell the court what passed between you. He had attempted to seduce you. It is too dreadful to recall. And you did at least rebuff his advances. I did disdain him most definitely. Perhaps so. I called him a shopman, a wretch and a scoundrel. And he did further insult you? He did. How so? No. No? You'll answer the question, Miss Porter. Precisely what the insult was. Blast your eyes, you damned bitch. I would take particular pleasure in murdering you and drowning you in your own blood. It is very familiar. I put it to you, Miss Porter, that on that occasion, Mr. Williams did insult you most scandalously and indecently, but there was never another one. Am I to be insulted again? I put it to you. For those insults, you determined never to forgive him and to gain revenge. You seek revenge by portraying Mr. Williams as the monster and the man who cut you. Oh. Oh. Madam, your agitation seems to occur at the most convenient time. Withdraw, sir. My lord, I ask you to bring my learned friend to order. Very well. Mr. Garrow, do not insult the witness. Very well. Porter, I accept that you were indeed attacked and cruelly used, but not by this prisoner. Behold him, Miss Porter. A man it is easy to accuse in that he is an unsympathetic figure, his position in society generally despised, his social habits far from respectable. But does he deserve this accusation and the death it may bring him? Does he deserve the way you have set your eyes upon him? He should not have set them upon me! That is your answer. Now we do most certainly have your answer. You do hide your own iniquity. No more questions, my lord. Court will adjourn. Rise. My chambers. Scheming, swooning, irrational, she acts like a defective man. And Garrow, a heartless one. She deserves no one's pity or admiration. Who's the real hater of women? The monster or his counsel? Judge Buller awaits me. Prosecution fails. Mr. Garrow. The court is yours. It's not Garrow's. My duty is to give advice as to the law, as to proof. Williams's conviction may answer your difficulties in Parliament, but this jury may not even convict. Well, then it is your duty to direct the jury to see it favourably. Mr. Garrow. Lady Sarah, you are alone. Sir Arthur did need the ear of Judge Buller. In this case. I fear he does not attend him for entertainment. 
Ah, I think the jury may yet acquit. If the judge does turn their attention to the law and away from the hue and cry... The judge will not. I think we may be in want of one very particular law, Mr. Sutas. Indeed. Gentlemen, the attack on Miss Porter is not in dispute. Her identification of her attacker, absolute. And the motive of the prisoner, apparent. As for his alibi, that's barely credible and certainly not convincing. This is a man who had previously waylaid Miss Porter with lewd intent and when these intentions were frustrated, threatened her most violently. You have before you an opportunity to remove this foul potential from the streets of London and restore peace of mind to its gentle women. I trust you will do your duty by them. You will consider your verdict. You have reached a verdict? We have. How do you find the prisoner? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Oh, Damn no. the lot of you! This is a lynching, not a trial! Brennick Williams, you've been found guilty of the indictment. The sentence I pronounce upon you... My lord! ...is that you be... My lord, I submit that my client has been wrongly indicted and that any sentence be respited. You're a little late in the day, Mr. Garrow. My lord, if you will allow me. Mr. Sylvester. My lord. Very well, I will hear you. In 1721, certain weavers were objecting to the importation of Indian fashions purchased in preference to their own goods actually poured aqua fortis onto the clothes of people wearing those fashions. Now, to stop these outrages, it was made a felony, punishable by hanging, to assault any persons in the public streets with intent to tear, spoil, burn, deface, or cut the garments of such persons. My lord, the clothes of my client were cut. Yes, but my lord, you did accept the evidence of Anne Porter, who quotes my client as wishing to murder her. You did hear and accept the testimony of the wounds to her flesh. Now, this surely would prove by my client an intent to maim or kill, which is a misdemeanor. A misdemeanor? Strange in fact, but true in law. Therefore, therefore... Mr. William should face a retrial for the minor offence for the misdemeanour of willfully and maliciously cutting Anne Porter with intent to maim and kill her. It was, of course, impossible for him to strike Miss Porter's person without cutting the clothes. Unless he did, in fact, cut the clothes in order to get to the flesh underneath. It's an ancient statute. And the indictment is indeed debatable. I shall reserve the case for the 12 judges of England. Sentence is respited until then. What does this mean? You will at least not hang. Why did you come here? I was sent here. By whom? You wish only to engage me. In what, sir? Certainly not the truth. The Home Secretary sent me. In all this, I wanted nothing more than the safety of the city. But it was a weak law to try a man's life with. All law is weak if men can bend it to their will. I did not succeed there. Mr. Garrow is very persuasive. Mr. Garrow saved an innocent man's life. Lady Sarah. Neither the old Bailey or I can detain you further. I'm already detained by you, sir. It is injustice that quickens your heart? 
You are mistaken in that. Mr. Rowland. A foul attack monster still infects the streets. Tomorrow's edition. But this is the Times, not the Gazette. Angsim would not allow it. The Times were very happy to employ me. Three more attacks, identical, all committed during William's incarceration. You come with this now? This would have served justice during the trial, Mr. Rawlings, not after it. My position is only now just secured. Oh, so you are safely in your new employment while William still rots in Newgate? I'm afraid there is more. The runners have a man for the crimes. I would happily lay my hands on you, Rawlings. But I will instead shake the hand of my client. Come, William. Which should prove to be a most welcome occasion. <laughs> and I shall be even happier to tell his mother. Indeed, Mr. Sweetlass. Gentlemen, it appears the rough court of Newgate has given its own verdict here. should be a free one and a living I would offer her consolation in prayer but God will not change the law You think him not guilty? I defended her as best I could. Oh! Mr. Forrester, still filling your pockets with blood money. Many in the house hope he will lose. You greatly overestimate Mr. Garrow's influence. How much would a criminal pay? Well, I wouldn't know. You are ill-prepared. Be reckless with your own life, not your clients. Beast! Garrow's Law is back again next Sunday night at the later time of 10 o'clock. Tonight, the news is just starting on BBC One and here on BBC HD, Ray Mears is following in the footsteps of one of his heroes in the northern wilderness. Next. <laughs>